This is our last lecture in this series. We're going to look at non-conservative mechanical systems. This means paying a little more attention to which matrices are symmetric and anti-symmetric. The basic teaching tool will be a robot fisherman. We'll look at its static response and show how static error in positioning uh, occurs. Then we'll look at its dynamic stability which is equivalent to systems where the gain is turned up and they become unstable in some sense. We'll have a problem session with some three more problems. Let's suppose that your assignment as an engineer is to create a mechanical robot to sit on the banks of a stream and fish. You might think about what this would require and what kind of motion would actually catch a fish and pull it out of the water. The structure that we're going to propose is somewhat human looking. In other words, it has something like an arm with a fishing rod at the end of it. Let's consider a very simple model and it will remind you a little of our fly swatter example earlier. This part of the robot is considered to be either elastic or rigid. We'll ultimately make it rigid before we do any solution, however. The fishing rod is definitely elastic and has a mass and stiffness characteristic. The weight of the fish will be downward on the end of the rod here. I'm going to break the analysis into two parts. One is what I call the static response. We're going to put a sensor at the tip of the rod that is going to measure the angle from the horizon. And if the fish pulls it down, then the static idea is for the robot to raise the fishing rod until the tip becomes level. That's somewhat logical because that's sort of what you would do and you would be able to look out to the end of the rod and decide if it were level or not. Now the amount that it deviates from that, that is the amount that it has a non-zero slope at the tip, will be considered an error. And uh, that presence then will be what we're interested in on static response. Now when you talk about dynamic instabilities, you mean that is it possible with no load on here at all that the system unloaded will suddenly start to oscillate? That can happen if the control system has its gain, and that is its stiffness and velocity dependent terms turned up so far that something in the motion of the bare rod allows the phasing in time to be such as to cause a flutter. And it turns out that can happen in this case. The actuator that we use will be rotary and we'll put a moment in at the base of the rod at the hand of the robot fisherman basically and it will adjust that to always try to oppose a rotation at the tip of the rod. In other words, the robot will try to hold the tip horizontal. You see, that would keep the rod from going into the water, for instance, which is what a, a real fisherman would try to do. We'll use these symbols K and C for the actuator stiffness and damping. I'll use the word damping and velocity dependent interchangeably, so don't worry about that. Then the uh, robot and the rod mass are given uh, matrices uh, with and without the carrot, and the robot and the rod stiffness, likewise. The weight of the fish, script F, is going to be vertical and positive downward shown here. So uh, it will always be down since it's gravitational, so we'll just take that script F with its own sign convention. We will first assemble the equations of motion and then look at the various matrices involved. We'll comment on what the symmetry or lack thereof of the coefficient matrices means. For physical modeling, we'll use the Euler-Bernoulli beam theory. 
will have motion confined to the xy plane with no axial force or motion present and no flexure out of the plane nor torsional vibration. At the far wall on the left, there will be no slope nor deflection. The V is the relevant uh, lateral deflection of the central axis of the beam. We're not going to look at the weight of the actuator and the rod as loads. The weight, that is, we're, we're neglecting gravity in that regard. Now, they're going to be much less than the fish, hopefully. <laughs> anyway, if we catch a big fish. Uh, we'll ignore the mass of the actuator and the sensor. Presumably, the sensor is a very small device out at the tip of the, uh, of the rod. We'll ignore structural damping. Now, the things that we're going to keep, you'll see in a minute in the equations of motion. Our finite element modeling now uh, will basically be the choice of the bar element for our two beams in the problem, one representing the robot's arm and the other the flexible rod. Because at the wall to the left, we're going to constrain these, it's a rigid wall, we can uh, do that and partition out those two equations. Furthermore, U5 and U3 will be pinned together, so those are identical. And the push and pull in terms of the moments at the actuator here will be equal and opposite through Newton's um, third law. And um, that's what the actuator can do is just put a uh, moment that's opposite in sign on U6 compared with what it puts on U4. We'll make that moment, however, proportionate to the tip rotation shown here and make it oppose that. Now in the XY coordinate system, Z is out toward us. Positive moments are those that are counterclockwise. This one is clockwise, so it carries a sine minus on it. The desired moment that's applied to the end of the fishing rod at its base is reacted by the robot's arm and in equal and opposite manner. So here's our force on the robot arm. F6 was the live load that we were trying to control the fishing rod with. We need the minus sign for, for the equal and opposite reaction. So we get that force again as proportionate to both the perceived angular error at the tip as well as the rate of angular error. We consider these moments as external at the present before we build them into the uh, equivalent finite element model. When we form the equations of motion here and when we first assembled we put those actuator forces here on the right hand side as if they were external. The assembled equations of motion are shown here for the five remaining degrees of freedom. Remembering that we've um, taken um, U5 equal to U3 in the case of the translation at the joint. And that's been condensed out. Now, with these degrees of freedom, we get the rod properties such as the rod mass sprinkled around degrees of freedom three, six, seven, and eight, and there is no structural damping. And then on the stiffness side here, you get uh, both the um, robot itself, which is the hatted quantity or the carotid quantity in this corner, and then you get the beam stiffness out in the degrees of freedom three, six, seven, eight again. On the right, you have the true physical uh, reaction F3, and uh, F7 could be the live load of the fish. And then you get the robotic forces here 
which which physically are internal, but we are temporarily treating as external and shown here. Since we want to drive the tip rotation to zero, there is no command angle nor command velocity. We want that to be exactly horizontal. At this point, we'll simplify a little further. We'll set the live load out at the tip to be minus script F, the weight of the fish, because it's downward. And then we move the actuator moments to the left-hand side of the equation. And uh, it's now that we set the robot re body to be rigid, which means that we don't have to carry that U3 degree of freedom, uh, nor the U4, because those will both be zero. Then we can partition and bring down this reduced set of equations shown here, which is a three by three set of equations. We can already see that the uh, stiffness matrix here is non-symmetric because of the appearance here of the robot stiffness. Likewise, the velocity dependent term here is non-symmetric. So it looks as if there's some skullduggery afoot here and this uh, actuator this time might cause us some problems in stability. There's a theorem in matrix algebra that says that you can decompose an arbitrary matrix into the sum of a symmetric and an anti-symmetric matrix. We have obtained two such matrices shown on the left. You don't have to prove this theorem in our case. Just see that you can recover the original matrix by adding the symmetric and skew-symmetric components that we have given here. The word skew symmetric means the same as anti-symmetric. If you mean that it's a general matrix, once in a while people use the word asymmetric. And that leads to some confusion between asymmetric and anti-symmetric, but the words are unique. They really have meaning. In any event, this symmetric part can be shown in damping problems to cause a dissipative force. This skew symmetric term here, which is on the velocity dependent uh, terms, is gyroscopic. Down here on stiffness, you can show that the symmetric part is a conventional elastic stiffness and stores energy. It's a typical elastic spring. But the one that's skew symmetric over here is what is called circulatory and can lead to a perpetual motion machine. You can either take energy out of the system or put energy in, depending on the, uh, the various forms of skew symmetry. What I meant by the various forms of skew symmetry is that you can have different signs and magnitudes um, in that matrix, and then that will determine whether or not it is a energy creator or an energy sink. Let's tabulate some of these ideas here. The symmetric type of velocity dependent um, terms can either uh, take energy out or put it in. It's more typically the source of the single degree of freedom instability. It's a kind of flutter that's more of uh, just a single frequency, such as the screech in an amplifier in a public auditorium where the gain is turned up too much and there's positive feedback between the loudspeaker and the speaker's light microphone. Uh, a common example is just viscous damping. If it's anti-symmetric, then there's no work done by this set of loads. Uh, and these are typically gyroscopic or cor Coriolis forces. But these, although they cannot cause the instability directly, they can affect stability indirectly by the way they uh, unbalance the system in the presence of other non-conservative loads. Symmetric stiffnesses here are the ones that are energy conserving and can store energy, and we think of those as elastic forces. Often if uh, an aerodynamic force is like this, it's considered to be an elastic spring, and so on. <laughs>
the anti-symmetric stiffnesses are the tough ones. They can uh, either put energy in or take it out. They can cause the multiple degree of freedom flutter. They're called circulatory forces. Our first look at a solution will involve the static response of our fisherman robot. The robot attempts to hold zero error measured by this angle at the tip of the rod. The weight of the fish, however, pulls it down. It's a battle between this overturning moment that the fish puts on the rod compared with the stiffness of the actuator, which is trying to rotate it back. This time, fortunately, the actuator is able to sense the local rotation out at this tip, and therefore there is no penalty due to the, uh, in the static air, due to the flexibility of the rod, because it's definitely trying to correct out here. Watch that as it goes along. It's an amazing thing, and the answer will come out that the stiffness of the rod doesn't matter at all. Uh, so uh, having a sensor out there is much more uh, accurate than having a sensor at the root here, but it also leads to instability. When we reduce to a static model, we neglect all the time-dependent terms but then we keep the beam stiffness terms, the weight of the fish, the stiffness of the actuator, and so on. We'll now look at the reduced static equations. These cover the rotations at both the left and right ends of the flexible fishing rod, as well as the translation at the tip of the rod. So U6 and U8 are the rotations. U7 is the translation of the tip. We non-dimensionalize the translation by dividing by the length of the rod. And then we clear out the various coefficients to end up with this simpler set of equations in a non-dimensional form. So you can see there's one non-dimensional loading parameter here. There's a non-dimensional stiffness parameter here. And non-dimensional displacements there. We could proceed directly to our solution now using Kramer's rule. But instead, let's stop a minute and think about dimensional analysis. There is a theorem called the Buckingham Pi theorem that helps a person think from very fundamental reasoning what kinds of variables and how many of them ought to be involved in the problem. Now, we already found an analytical solution where the non-dimensional displacements were functions of a non-dimensional stiffness and a non-dimensional load. Could we have figured that out by other logic from here on down on the Buckingham Pi theorem? And the answer is yes, you could. At least get it in a general form. Um, our variables in the problem, if we're interested, say, in U8, which is the rotation at the tip, would have been U8, the rod uh, stiffness. I'm sorry, this is the uh, actuator stiffness, length of the rod, flexural rigidity of the rod, and the weight of the fish. And then dimensionally, I've put the dimensions under there. Now, this is a static problem. Time doesn't occur. We have five physical terms minus two fundamental dimensions involved. There could have been as many as three mechanical dimensions. The pi theorem says, in general, you ought to have three pi terms. And that's what we did get up here, interestingly, at this stage, in, in the stage of our uh, equation. The pi theorem doesn't really tell you in what way to gather your terms, except dimensionally. And these would all be various candidates of uh, weights, stiffnesses. Um, and so we could have chosen any three of these. 
this one we're viewing as a dependent variable, and you would have taken two of the others. Now, our equations literally pointed out that you get this one naturally, and this one here we got naturally in, in just working out analytically. But in principle, you could have gotten these other terms or any squared or cube of them uh, had you felt that that was more of a important physical ratio. Now let's return to the analytical solution. I wanted just to give you a taste of what the Buckingham Pi theorem could do. In the continuation of the analytical solution, you have the ratio of determinants. We're solving for the third of those uh, variables in the three equations. So here's our force vector on the uh, right side of the equation appearing in that column. When you turn the crank and, and uh, simplify this, you find that there's some cancellation, and you find that there's a relation between just two of the three uh, equations, or two of the three terms there. Now that's very unusual, and you wouldn't have expected it. Had we solved for U6 and U7, though, we would have had the three uh, variables all intertwined, but this one came out simpler than we'd expect. And in fact, then, you get such a law here that uh, the error U8 is a negative of this loading parameter. So that if the fish is a positive weight fish here, uh, you come down to this point and find that the beam will have a negative slope at the tip of, of that much. And that makes sense because uh, we've taken script F positive downward, and so we're going to get at the tip of the beam a negative angle, uh, which we call U8. The Buckingham Pi theorem is correct, though, in general, because the other two variables do uh, couple with both of the independent ratios, as shown here. If you continue the Kramer rule solution for the other two variables. And so it was only fortuitous that this zero occurred here. And remember I said at the outset, it was really interesting then that the error out at the tip of the fishing rod here doesn't depend on the stiffness of the fishing rod. That's because the sensor is out there and compensates for whatever uh, droop is in the rod. And uh, you find then that the error here only depends on the moment put on the rod by the fish uh, over the um, rotary stiffness of the actuator. Well, I thought this was neat. And uh, I thought I would uh, do a little side excursion here and just check the MSC DMAP language to see if it would help us on solving the same set of equations rather than using Kramer's rule. And again, I want to expose you to this in an easy problem because we need this in a few minutes. Um, I took specific values of these physical variables, uh, and then together they imply this, which will occur also in our formulation. Um, and that implies that you would get this result. So we know the result that we should get. But let's go look at the non-dimensional equations that we derived earlier. And here are these non-dimensional equations. And then we're putting in the values that um, are test values in our case, and then seeing if we get the right results. Now, the DMAP language allows the NASTRAN user to write their own matrix equations and solve them. I've had to name these various vectors. For instance, this vector is called DISPL, for obvious reasons. This one's called LoadVec. And I call the portion of the stiffness that was due to the actuator, namely this thing here, with zeros everywhere else, K actuator, and then K rod is the remaining physical um, stiffnesses there. And assembling these two together, I call them stiff. So we ended up with a very simple algebraic set of equations here with a 3 by 3 
square matrix and it's non-symmetric. Next I read in the actuator stiffness and uh, it has its own bookkeeping entry and then the actual data. There's only one column there so it's not hard to handle. Then you also have the load vector with the uh, bookkeeping card and then the um, the actual vector of data. Then I run the problem and we print the results out here. You echo out the stiffness matrix. Uh, a problem in a sense is that although it's reading out columns, they they come out looking like rows and so you get a bit of an inversion in sense here. Um, the term here is actually K13. It's, uh, it's row 1, column 3. And this is row 2, column 3, row 3, column 3. So uh, if these terms were actually bundled in their normal matrix form, this term here is the one that goes up in the uh, upper right hand corner here. It's the only unusual term. So um, watch these little outputs like this because they are sometimes uh, uh, tricky to read. The displacement solution is now printed out and these are the terms in the vector and they exactly match the analytical solution. So this shows that our DMAP procedure is correct, gives the same answers as a small analytical solution. I wanted to expose you to that because later we're going to need the DMAP approach for some serious equations, ones which have complex solutions and would be too hard to carry out by hand. Let's look at the stability of this robot fisherman now. Imagine this stream flowing through the beautiful countryside and this robot fisherman pulling in fish, hopefully with a uh, owner that really appreciates them. And now the question is, what if you um, adjust those stiffnesses in the fisherman's uh, actuator that might cause it to go unstable? because you'd hate to see this uh, thing having something equivalent to an epileptic seizure out there. Well, we go to the full set of dynamic equations for this, and we zero out what was once a static force in this location. Now the question is, what are the values of the coefficients c and k that might cause dynamic or even uh, monotonic divergence uh, as forms of instability? This is similar to other stability studies for the homogeneous differential equations. You look for harmonic solutions and decide whether or not the time uh, dependence makes it grow in time or subside in time. First, let's put this in a uh, non-dimensional form. We'll assume harmonic motion here with e to the pt behavior. Then we put in the physical beam stiffnesses and masses. I'm willing to use consistent mass for a little better accuracy here. On the right, I have a non-dimensional displacement at the tip, phi 7. Note that the frequency term, p squared, appears in uh, every one of these components. It occurs also to the first power in this term here, which we recognize as a uh, pseudo-damping term. Let's pause at this moment and take a look at Buckingham Pi analysis again to see if we're somewhat in the right ballpark. We have dependent variables in the problem of the frequency of oscillation, or at least a frequency parameter and then the uh, various mode shapes that might occur. 
I'm going to give the mode shape a specific pi number, pi 2, uh, thinking ahead a bit. These are physical quantities here. This is running mass per length of the beam. This is the flexural rigidity. And then we have the total length of the beam, the actuator stiffness, and the actuator velocity dependent term. Um, if we forget about um, the mode shapes for now, let's think about p here as a function of these other and therefore, Buckingham Pi would say that there ought to be three independent terms here, that we ought to have pi 1, perhaps, depending on a pi 3 and a pi 4. Later, if we want to solve for the uh, dependent variable pi 2, we could make it depend on pi 3 and pi 4 as well. Uh, these non-dimensional ratios have been suggested by what we see in the analytical solution. There is a little bit of um, complication on this term. It's a little bit hard to figure out. And it's only through skullduggery that we're able to identify how to do this particular damping term. We can now write the non-dimensional form of the equations by using these pi terms. Here's the algebraic form of our equations of motion, where the harmonic assumption has led to these frequency terms sprinkled throughout the equation. This pi 1, as you remember, is a function of the frequency parameter p squared. By careful choice of this velocity dependent term here, which many people think of as a damping term, uh, it freezes to pull out the frequency dependence here as the square root of pi 1. For this set of equations to have a non-trivial solution in these eigenvector components, we must have the determinant of the coefficients to be 0. Because the pi 1 is squared in p, the characteristic polynomial will be a sixth degree polynomial. The robotic stiffness occurs in this pi term pi 3. So we've got robotic stiffness here. We've got robotic damping here. Writing this out um, in a form that's a little easier to see here, but just as a um, uh, a set of equations that depend, first of all, on the square of frequency, and then the first power of frequency, and then this term here, which is frequency independent, you have the following equation. I'm now using pi 2 as the non-dimensional eigenvector set of terms. The characteristic equation itself, which is the determinant of these coefficients to be 0, does not involve pi 2. It only involves pi 1, the frequency term, as a function of the robot stiffness and the robot damping terms. Our motion, of course, depends like e to the pt, shown here. And the stability depends on the real part of P. The real part is the envelope of the oscillation. And if it's positive, then you get a growing oscillation in time. If it's negative, you get a subsiding oscillation. Pi 1 is our frequency parameter. It does involve the stiffness of the fishing rod as well. The eigenvalue that we're really interested in, though, is the square root of pi 1, so that we get it only in terms of the frequency's real and imaginary part, and not the square of that, as shown up above. Taking the square root of these physical parameters doesn't affect things, because those are always real positive numbers. Well, let's do a DMAP solution now. This problem is too difficult for us to solve by hand. The um, stability polynomial, the so-called characteristic equation, is a sixth degree polynomial. We'll have to cut out the damping from the actuator in order to make it manageable. 
and we don't have any external forces such as the fish. We're going to solve this problem rather thoroughly where the frequency is a function of the actuator stiffness. Of course, all in suitable non-dimensional ratios. And then we'll present the results um, in the figure of the square root of pi 1 uh, imaginary versus pi 3. Uh, this will be the frequency part and we will uh, comment on the stability uh, as it varies along those curves. I'm going to write a DMAP program for specific values of the parameter pi 3. We'll take the example of pi 3 equals 3. Again, I use Sol 100 and we compile the DMAP. We print out the various stiffnesses. Again, we have the uh, fishing rod stiffness, K rod, and the servo stiffness. We add the two stiffnesses to get the system stiffness and then print it out. Then this is our complex eigenvalue extraction with quite a few parameters here having to do with the eigenvalue and the eigenvectors. Uh, below here I've got the data entry for our matrices uh, starting with the rod stiffness. Next, I enter the stiffness of the actuator, uh, which is only one column. Then I have the mass of the rod with its uh, bookkeeping entry and then the uh, columns. Here's my uh, complex eigenvalue solver using this Hessian approach for complex eigenvalues. Results are printed out as is shown below here. And uh, here's a echo of the matrix uh, for the mass of the rod. Next, I um, output the system stiffness, shown here. The place where the three value for the actuator stiffness enters is here which would be the upper right corner. And that contrasts to just the rod stiffness, which is here. And when I say rod, I mean fishing rod, <laughs> not a rod element. It's really a bar element. Well, the results that we get out are shown below for the eigenvalues. And uh, it gives the imaginary parts here, and then it gives the real part to the left here. So this is the frequency. Uh, let's look at the eigenvectors for this problem, remembering that they are a function of the robotic stiffness to the fishing rod stiffness ratio. We've done some calculations for that ratio that we've called pi 3 equal to 3.0. Here are the tabular results, and below are shown the three eigenvectors in the problem. One might have expected there to have been perhaps uh, one nodal crossing here, two here, and three here. Uh, we seem to be getting, in fact, counting the left zero crossing, uh, two, two, and three. And so you might wonder what's going on here. But let me explain that this first eigenvector derives from the rigid body rotation of that fishing rod when the robotic stiffness is turned off. And so this would have been a mode in its purest form without robotics intervening as a pure straight line here. Uh, so that helps you understand the zero crossing effects a little bit better. Let's show a figure of oscillation frequency for the robot arm as a function of the actuator stiffness. We did a calculation in detail showing these three solutions for frequency. All of those had zero real parts, which meant you had undamped oscillations. If we continue that study and try different values for 
this actuator stiffness, perhaps two and then four and so on, we find that these two branches of the frequency curve coalesce. And we find that the branch above that coalescence is actually unstable, with one branch uh, or one of the frequencies having positive real part on the frequency and the other one having negative. So you get one unstable root then in this problem. So we have flutter up there. So we've got the interesting case where we have, down below this point, we have stable solutions, and up above we have unstable. The instability is strange in a way because when you get above 20 values here on actuator stiffness, then you get divergence, a static divergence. That means that if we were to turn the robot on with values roughly between 4 and 20, it would oscillate and beat itself to death. If you turn it on and it had an actuator ratio, stiffness ratio above 20, it would monotonically slew in a big circle and clobber whoever was nearby in just one uh, swing. The branch shown here for the third frequency is neutrally stable at all times. So this chart is not at all unusual. Channel flutter at supersonic flow and wing flutter uh, at both sub and supersonic flow is similar. If you add damping in the problem, you can sometimes delay the onset of flutter slightly above this uh, coalescence point and um, get some slight benefit. But damping is generally not very successful in preventing this kind of coupled mode flutter. Let me summarize some of those results that I had mentioned verbally in the previous figure. The robot fisherman goes berserk at this stiffness ratio greater than four, and that's with no damping. Damping would probably delay the on Let me summarize some of those results that I had mentioned verbally in the previous figure. The robot fisherman goes berserk at this stiffness ratio greater than four, and that's with no damping. Damping would probably delay the onset of the instability. It's a coupled mode type of flutter when two frequencies coalesce. The robot fisherman has a static instability at stiffness ratios greater than 20. And lastly, we've arrived at this paradox that to have better position accuracy, we'd like to increase the gain. On the other hand, that degrades the stability. And this is often the case. So you have to pick some intermediate value that you can live with. We would have to put our robot fisherman out on the bank with a actuator stiffness gain uh, ratio at less than well, it's time for a problem session. Let's start out with a non-conservative problem here. This is a planar truss with a single live load over here shown in red. And what we'd like to do is minimize the displacement response out here at U6. It's going to exert a force proportional to U6, but opposite in sense. And it's going to apply the uh, system. And the fact that you're sensing the displacement here and opposing it over here is the problem. The live load was clear over here. So this is interesting. We're going to assume that this F4 value is reacted against the ground. So we could either show it bumping against some firm ceiling up here, or we could ground it down in the other direction if we wish. Let's show the relevant equations for this system, and then let's characterize the system. We'll model this system with discrete truss elements. We'll remove the degrees of freedom at the ground, because those degrees of freedom are...
I'm just using general terms for the stiffness and mass coefficients. The actuator force acts on U6 as shown, opposing its displacement we can absorb that actuator force into the system stiffness matrix. We can identify what we think of as an actuator finite element, a fictitious element joining degrees of freedom 4 and 6. Um, a little more conservative way to do the model, and probably preferred by some people, would be to show how the actuator is connected between that point on the truss and ground, say the, the ceiling up above, and creating temporarily a degree of freedom U7 there, that would be ultimately uh, constrained and uh, partitioned out. The uh, point at which you're sensing is not the point at which the corrective force is applied. And this could cause instabilities because of a non-symmetric stiffness matrix. Problems two and three in this session are really not non-conservative problems. It's the last two problems in the course. The model of the screw going into the wall is a very simple one. So I'm doing some physical modeling here. I, I did this because of some actual practice, whereas you really tighten a screw into something like a hardwood, uh, like oak, and you've underdrilled your, your hole, it really can get harder and harder to drive that as you turn the screw. And so I've just presumed a linear law here that the force uh, required, and it's a torque in this case, to turn the screw is proportionate to the uh, screwdriver blade angle. And I've chosen this coefficient. So suppose the robot is commanded to turn the screw 0 to 90 degrees as the instrument itself senses. Then the question is, what is the actual angle that the screw is turned considering that there's some degradation of the position by the elastic arm. OK. So in our solution, we're going to consider the connection between the screwdriver blade and the screw head to be rigid. Uh, and then we will try to solve for the angle U3, which will give us a measure of how close we have come to 90 degrees. That is an absolute angle since the wall is fixed, and so that will be how far the screw has turned. Now let's assemble the equation of equilibrium. This is a static problem, so we don't get into inertial and uh, damping effects. The actuator forces are shown here, and you have to get the signs right on these. Uh, the one is the live moment applied to the screw, and the other one is the reaction moment against the elastic rod. The rod itself is modeled here, which is just a small torsional element. The screw is modeled as a small torsional element. And now we can assemble, putting those actuator forces uh, in the proper places on the right-hand side for these two components, F2 and F3. The equation of equilibrium is shown here as we've brought in the actuator moments. This is a static equation of equilibrium rather than an equation of motion because we've not posed it as a dynamics problem. When we put in the proper numbers over here for the command angle of pi over 2, then we get a completely numerical problem. We've moved the homogeneous stiffness terms to the left that have to do with the actuator moments. We partition out the second and third equations because uh, u1 and u4 have been constrained to 0. We can solve for those reaction moments, f1 and f4, later if we so desire.
the reduced set of equations is shown below, and those are simply solved by Kramer's rule in the next figure. Kramer's rule uses the ratio of two determinants. Since we're interested in the variable u3, which is the rotation of the screw head, uh, we substitute the force vector here into the uh, second of the column vectors in this matrix of coefficients here. And we get the answer 81.1 degrees. We were asked to drive that screw in 90 degrees and only reached um, a fraction of that. So we're about nine degrees short of our goal. That's due to sensing of a relative angle rather than an absolute angle at the screw head. And the reason those are different is due to the rod elasticity. Our last problem is an actively controlled shock absorber for an airplane. These kinds of uh, active controls are going to become more and more common. I think we will have this in automobiles as a common feature uh, in not too distant a future. I want to consider how an airplane might bounce upon landing and how the shock absorber might be used to reduce that kind of bounce. Many of us are aware of that when we land on commercial airplanes. We'll have the mass of the airplane uh, viewed as a point mass and then some elasticity, uh, that, so that's a sprung mass here between the airplane and the upper end of the um, shock absorber proper. Then the uh, shock absorber, which I'm viewing as an active joint, will be this cloud-like structure, which will have another node. Uh, so it's the spring going across here, and I sketch that in the next figure, along with the uh, dash pot for its damping character. Then from this node, uh, let's lump that all the way to ground so that we can connect to ground. And there would be a certain springiness involved there. A lot of that would be in the tire itself. The idea is that we would give the aircraft a certain downward velocity with the bottom of the wheel fixed and then watch and see what happens from that point on. I'm only interested in developing the equations of motion here, otherwise we'd have to do some a lengthy computation and develop the physics of this. We're going to neglect the mass of the landing gear and eliminate any unnecessary degrees of freedom. So we have the mass of the aircraft up at this node, um, which is by far the dominant mass in the system. Uh, it's the gap between nodes two and three that is the uh, shock absorbing part of the landing gear. And then U4 will be made in contact with the ground at, uh, at a zero displacement for all times. Here I give some of the parameters of the problem in metric form. And uh, here I give some of the stiffnesses of the system. Let's assemble our equations of motion. These are relatively placid in that the stiffness matrix is symmetric, so we don't have circulatory forces. We do have a damping matrix which can absorb energy. The mass of the airplane itself dominates the inertia effects, and we neglect other masses. Here we have the damping effect of the uh, actively controlled shock absorber. And then we have the stiffnesses of the actuator in the uh, stiffness term here. Over here are the command values for the live control system. Our last step is to partition out the degree of freedom at the ground because it's constrained to be zero at all times. So we don't really discard it. We could use it later to find the reaction force at the ground, but we set it aside. That would be a nice way to put it. And then putting in all the numerical values, these are the equations of motion for the system. And we can integrate those numerically for any set of initial conditions that we'd like.
uh, using perhaps the Newmark beta approach.